Hello and welcome to Hot and Heavy, the Elaine Bennis podcast. I'm your host, Shivani Desai. Today I'll be talking about Season 4, Episode 22, The Pilot. Hello, everyone. I hope everyone's doing well. I'm uh, doing okay. I usually have banter planned for this part of the pod, but I think I'm just going to get into the episode. I woke up with a migraine today and, you know just not fun. (laughs) Not sure if any of you get migraines, but they're not fun. So um, I kind of am in that, it's not terrible, but feel like I'm woozy, hungover a little bit. So forgive me if maybe I misspeak every now and then. It's the, it's the migraine. It's not me. (laughs) So getting into this episode. The synopsis for part one. Now, I'm going to be dividing this episode since it's an hour long episode, technically 45 minutes. I'm going to be dividing it up into two episodes of the podcast so that this doesn't turn into a long droning podcast. Um, And so the part one synopsis is as follows. Jerry and George's pilot goes into pre-production as a cast is assembled. Russell Dalrymple's infatuation with Elaine leads to his failure to perform his network duties. George feels a white spot on his lip is cancer designed to keep him from ever being happy. Elaine is unhappy that the new owner of Monks seems to hire only large-breasted women. Kramer battles a bout of constipation. (laughs) Uh, That last line tickles me. Okay, so we start out in Jerry's apartment. Kramer is begging Jerry to be part of the cast. He should play Kramer. And Jerry says, absolutely not. And that, you know what? I can't act. Why should we have two people on the cast that can't act? (laughs) Of course, Kramer is very insulted that Jerry says he can't act. And then they get into this sort of back and forth challenge to fake laugh and be more convincing. George walks in and knows right away. He doesn't fall for it. Why are you guys fake laughing? George is concerned. They haven't heard from NBC. They're supposed to be casting that week. And so Kramer's like, okay, well, at least let me audition. (laughs) And George is on the same page as Jerry, out of the question. He just has a bad feeling about this. You know, where's Russell? No one's heard from Russell. Moving on to the next scene. Well, there's Russell at a restaurant waiting for Elaine. Elaine meets him at the table, and he's just desperate to talk to her. He can't get her out of his mind ever since they went out. Elaine is quick to point out that was two months ago. We see a flashback of Elaine flashing her cleavage to him. This was the first time they met. So he says, you know, ever since that moment, I can't get you out of my mind. And she points out, Russell, you are the president of NBC. You could get any woman you want. Well, he wants her. Elaine gets distracted by the snack mix on the table. She's annoyed that, you know, it's not just a bowl of pretzels or even peanuts would be okay, but I don't know who eats these cheesy things. Russell is pleading with her. And finally, she says, Russell, I got to be honest with you. I don't like television. And, And that's your life. And maybe if he was in Greenpeace, she could get on board. But network television, come on, you're part of the problem. Russell defends himself. He says, hey, you know what? We have some great new shows coming up. In fact, we have one with a bright young comedian named named Jerry Seinfeld. Have you heard of him? Elaine pretends to sort of recognize him. Oh, doesn't he do a lot of, did you notice this? Did you notice that type of comedy? And he's like, yes, yes, that's him. Oh, yeah. Um, What's the show about? And then Russell <laughs> goes into the same pitch that George gives in that original meeting about the show about nothing. And, and, and what did you do today? Elaine says, well, I got up, I went to work, and then I came here. But there you go. That's a show. Elaine says, look, this is the, I'm, I'm not interested in this. And I, look, I have to go. And he won't quit. He says, well, when, when are we going to see each other again? I'm sorry, Russell. I, I'm sorry. And then she leaves. My take on this scene, I think this is a really strong scene. Both Julia Louis-Dreyfus and Bob Balaban, who plays Russell Dalrymple, just great actors, first of all, super funny. So they have a good energy together. I really like this. I mean, we haven't really seen them in a scene together since that episode that they flashed back to, The Shoes. And so there really hasn't been any follow-up until this episode. And just a side note, I love Bob Balaban in pretty much anything. All of those Christopher Guest movies, of course, he's always a highlight. So much fun. 
And I really can't blame Elaine here. I mean, nothing, oh God, nothing is more unattractive than desperation. And Russell is not only desperate, but he's combining that with just this creepiness. So I I feel for Elaine, but I like how she handles it. Very, very direct and honest. That's how you have to be. And the fact that (laughs) Elaine hates television is so on brand. And I feel like, I feel like Elaine, you know, she's in publishing. She's probably a bookworm. And I don't think she's a snob by any means, but I I so believe this hating television thing. I just think she would think it's so stupid in general. And I guess this used to happen. I've never been to a place where they have like a, I guess you'd call it a pub mix in a bowl on a table. Um, It seems very odd to me. I'm sure it happens. And that's probably why it's in the episode. Maybe in New York they do this. But I'm with Elaine. Um, There's certain parts that you just don't really enjoy. For me, you know, I'm I'm thinking of the most popular snack mix, Chex Mix. I do love the dark rye chips. Those are my favorite. Pretzels are always good. I'll tolerate a peanut. I'm not, I don't need a peanut in there, but uh, now I really want Chex Mix. So I'm going to add that to my grocery list. But I'm kind of with Elaine on those little cheese things or like imitation cheese its But you know, if it's in a combined bite with a rye chip, a pretzel, maybe a couple of the checks. I love the corn checks in there. You know, I've given this a lot of thought, but um, <laughs> I'm with Elaine. I love this little distraction in the scene too. It's like she couldn't care less about Russell or his feelings right now. She All she wants to do is get her message across. And then, oh, okay, she sees this snack bowl. I'm just going to pay attention to this for a little bit. And I think it's a great touch that Russell wants the you know, the doubter of Jerry and George's show about nothing is now giving that same pitch to Elaine. I thought that was really fun or a good callback. But also we get to see that, oh, well, Russell's mind has been changed. Um, I mean, clearly they're doing the show. So I kind of like the clue into all of that. You know, (laughs) he's the one the pitch to get Elaine to go out with him again and be with him is a pitch for this show that uh, he didn't really like at first. So it's just a really fun moment. So I thought that was a really nice writing touch by Mr. Larry David. Oh, I forgot to mention this. The episode is written by Larry David. Next, we're in Jerry's apartment. Jerry's giving George a hard time. He's wearing sweatpants. You're telling the world you give up. I love this whole speech about sweatpants. And small tangent alert, but, um, you know, we're sort of living in the world now of athleisure where wearing sweatpants is socially acceptable. I mean, we we made strides with being in ensconced in velvet with those those uh, track suits, those juicy ones um, from a few years back. But uh, yeah, it's very now socially acceptable to wear sweatpants in public. And it doesn't have this same message to society that Jerry is giving George a hard time about. But I don't know. It's funny. I think this episode and this sentiment from Jerry uh Back when I heard it, I guess at 14, 13, 14, I very much it like it was tattooed on my brain. So even to this day, I've never been able to embrace the athleisure in public trend. And now there's really cute ones. I'm not judging people because some of these sweatpants, sweatshirt sets, they're like really cute and they're stylish and they're they're fitted better. You know, I think... What George is wearing is sort of those dumpy drawers, sweatpants that just don't look good on anyone. All right, tangent over. Jerry gets a call from NBC that casting is happening the next day. And he tells George, he says, see, it's on. Nothing to worry about. You're going to be successful. Uh, George doesn't look too happy. So next, we are at Dana Foley's office. We met Dana Foley a few episodes ago. She is George's therapist and a friend of Elaine's. And so he's in session with her and he... Looks like he's in physical pain when he's discussing this possibility of becoming successful. And he argues God would never let him be successful. He'd kill him first. Dana says, I thought you didn't believe in God. And he says, I do for the bad things. I love this line because I'm sort of the same way. Not that, I, not that I'm a total non-believer, but it, it, this rings true for me. <laughs> and she reassures him. Dana says, come on, George. God is not out to get you. And, you know, this is a good thing. Focus on that. But then she leans forward and asks about something on his lip. It's like a white discoloration on your top lip. And then she says with a very serious tone, you better get that checked out. I better get this checked out? I would. 
Well, of course, this sends George into a tizzy and <laughs> starts taking it out on Dana Foley. What kind of a therapist are you? And she says, I'm, I'm trying to help you. Well, he calls her a sadist and she says, I think you better go. Oh, I'm going, baby. This is sort of a callback to the last time she threw him out <laughs> because she said she didn't think the pilot was funny. All right, next we're in a cab and Jerry and George are in the back seat. George is showing Jerry the lip discoloration. And Jerry says, what are you talking about? It's nothing. And then George asks the cab driver if he sees it. And the cab driver, he sees it right away. Yeah, it's all white. And that he'd get it checked out if I were you. Again, with it checked out. George declares he is not going to the doctor. If he doesn't go, nothing bad will happen. Jerry says if you go, they might catch it in time. Catch what in time? Whatever it is. There's really no helping George at this point. A guy starts cleaning the cab with a rag and the cabbie tries to shoo him away, hates these guys with their filthy rags. Then Jerry sees it's crazy Joe Davola. He and George slunk down in the back, but Joe Davola has already seen them and he looks through the window very creepily and says, good luck on the pilot, Jerry. So crazy Joe Davola is back. And if you listen to those episodes of the pod, you know that I hate crazy Joe Davola. <laughs> Do not like the character, but he's back. Next, we are at the NBC office for the casting session. George, of course, is asking Jay and Stu about the discoloration. He's obsessing about it. And then they're about to get started when Jerry asks about Russell, why he's not there. Jay and Stu say, you know, he, he seems a little bit troubled lately. You know, it's probably the fall schedule. Oh, it's a bear. A dapper guy comes in to read for George. And there's voiceovers from Jerry and George to hear their thoughts. Jerry doesn't like him at all. George loves him. And his audition is totally unlike George, but George likes it because the guy's handsome. Another actor comes in for George, played by Jeremy Piven. He's bald and dumpy looking. He's already in character. Does a little bit about, you know, I was just at the podiatrist. I have gangrene. And they're all laughing. They think it's very funny. And so this guy asks, well, what's with this George character? He's just a real loser. George pipes in, no, not a loser. And his audition is spot on. Everyone is laughing, except for George. Next, we see an actress come in to audition for Elaine. She's very attractive, very bubbly, saying hi to everyone. And then she makes a crack about the waiting room. It's like a bald convention out there. Then she sees George and says, oops, uh, faux pas. Jerry says, no, no, he knows he's bald. And then she points out that there was a guy wearing sweatpants. I mean, does he walk around like that? I mean, this is all just getting on George's bad side pretty quick. Jerry offers to read with this beautiful woman, and she barely gets two lines into the audition. And George says, thank you, and ends the session. Now, this actress is played by Mariska Hargitay. And I actually forgot to do my research on Mariska for the podcast. I'm just realizing that now. But I don't think a lot has to be said. She is mega famous for, of course, Law and Order SVU. Plays Olivia Benson. Such a fantastic actress. I love her. I believe she's done, I saw this recently, she's done about 550 episodes of Law and Order um, SVU regular Law and Order, and then there was like a special crimes unit or something. Yeah, like every Law and Order iteration, Mariska Hargitay has been in over like 550 episodes. That's incredible. I think she's great. I love Mariska Hargitay. She's an amazing person, amazing actress. I love also, I respect the fact that she's one of the rare actresses in Hollywood who is aging in a realistic way, gracefully. You know, there's not a lot of work being done to try and look young or super skinny or just perfect and all that stuff. So a lot of respect for Mariska Hargitay. I think she's adorable in this little role. I, I love that she gets that little comedy moment of calling out George. Well, calling out the uh, qualities of George and how just unattractive they are and the other actors who are waiting in the waiting room. Another fun fact about Mariska Hargitay, she is the daughter of Jane Mansfield, who Jerry, of course, mentions in The Implant as a woman who had big breasts. So fun fact, not so fun because Jane Mansfield was killed in a car accident. OK, with that, we're going to move on. Um, then we get a montage of Kramers coming in to audition, a bunch of guys just doing funny door entrances. Then we see an actor who is really embodying Kramer, perfect for the role, come in, nails the audition. 
and uh, walks out with a box of raisins. You see it happen. And then we see Kramer walk in, except it's not Kramer, it's Martin Van Nostrand. Stu recognizes him from the Calvin Klein ads. I thought that was a nice touch. Kramer is so bad. Terrible audition. I don't know what kind of character he's trying to play. But then he stops pretty abruptly and excuses himself to go to the bathroom. And then we see this little, another little montage of Kramer trying to find a bathroom all over the city. Next, we are at Monk's. Elaine asks who's playing Elaine. And Jerry says, a very, very talented actress, and then makes up a really dumb bit about her being from Alaska and part of the Iditarod race. It's stupid. Elaine asks if Russell was at the casting, and Jerry says no. She's kind of worried about him. I mean, they had one date two months ago. She says, am I that charming and irresistible? And Jerry says, no, you're not. Elaine tries to ask for more coffee, but the waitress kind of walks by and ignores her. And she says, you know, the service has become so much worse since that new manager took over. Jerry asks if she notices anything else. Oh, they started putting lemon in the tuna. I love that. No, not the tuna, anything else. He says, look at the waitresses and asks what characteristic they all have in common. Elaine catches on to how they are all, well, proportioned the same. Big boobs. A waitress finally does come over to fill Elaine's coffee cup, and Elaine asks who's in charge of hiring. She points to an older gentleman at the counter. She adds that they're actually looking for another waitress, so if, you know, she knows anyone. The actress who plays this waitress is Samantha Dorman. She was a Playboy Playmate for many years. In fact, she was the Playmate of the Month, September of 1991. She's also starred in many Playboy videos, such as Wet n Wild Live, Playmates in Paradise and Erotic Fantasies 1 and 2. And I think she does a perfectly good job in this scene. Elaine says to Jerry, you know, this is discriminatory to just hire large-breasted women. And Jerry points out, look, good-looking men get advantages all the time. You never see any good-looking homeless. (laughs) Odd argument. Uh, My take, I like that Elaine is... uh, yeah, has this crusade as a, as a plot line. It's very Elaine, very on brand for her to be upset about something like this. So a uh, really good setup in this scene for that. And it's very fitting also that Jerry is the one that points it out. We all know Jerry is a boob man. He's not a leg man. Perfect little setup for this fun plot line. Next, we're at the doctor's office. A really quick scene. George is getting his little lip discoloration checked out. His doctor's like, oh, never seen that before. And that we're going to have to do a biopsy. This causes George to instantly panic. Cancer. Is it cancer? I don't know what it is. (laughs) I love the performance of that guy. (laughs) It's so great. Next, we're at Jerry's apartment. And George, of course, is panicking about the biopsy. And that, you know, he didn't get a get out of here when he mentioned cancer. And that they should teach doctors that in med school. Cancer, get out of here. And George just thinks, you know, this is because he wrote the pilot, the show will be successful, and he'll be dead. You know, he can't, he can't be successful. God wouldn't let him do that. So that, this is why this is all happening. And that, no, he's not even going to die with dignity. Kramer enters. Jerry asks what happened to him, and apparently he got mugged. Mugged? He wouldn't have minded it so much, but turns out he had to dump really bad, and that's why he left the audition. But because he couldn't find a toilet, he missed his chance, and he's all backed up now. Elaine enters and Kramer leaves. She tells Jerry and George she talked to some of her sisters about the coffee shop. And they all decided Elaine should go and apply for a job. She comes back from Jerry's bedroom wearing one of Jerry's shirts, which is, of course, super loose fitting on Elaine. And Jerry says, well, you're not going to get the job wearing that. Exactly. Jerry gets a phone call from TV Elaine and she wants to get together and talk about her role. Now, a little thing in this scene, I love that they're all sharing the same sandwich. (laughs) It's just cute. Beyond the sandwich sharing, my take on this scene, I love Elaine's plan to apply for the job. This is our headstrong Elaine that we all know. We all love her. She's not taking any shit. I do have to say a little scene swap, maybe, um, or just allotting a little bit more time to a George and Elaine argument here. I feel like this whole thing seems pretty teed up to have George and Elaine uh, butt heads. Something where George would accuse Elaine 
of maybe being a hypocrite. You know, like if, if there was a bunch of handsome men who were waiters at a restaurant, she would love it or something like that. I just feel like there could have been a little bit of like a headbutt here um, because I love a good George and Elaine argument when they go at each other because they're so funny together. But I also think there is so much going on in this episode um, that honestly, I'm a little surprised that Elaine and Kramer even have individual plots as it is. So I'm thankful for that because I think that pilot uh, plot is just such a huge you know, chunk of the episode. But I do feel they could have, I don't know, shaved off a little bit of like the raisin stealing stuff or some of the casting footage for just a good solid Elaine and George debate on this whole big boobed waitress thing. I think it would have been really funny. Next, we are at a restaurant. Jerry and TV Elaine are at a table and she's asking about, you know, what Elaine is all about. Jerry's giving dumb answers. Greenland, she loves throwing garbage out the window, yet she's extremely dainty. She'd eat a hamburger with her hands, also pasta with her hands. Her favorite movie is Shaft. Loves talking during sex, but not dirty talk, just chit chat. Jerry tries to tell Sandy that he has to leave at a certain point, but she corrects him. Call me Elaine. And then she asks how Elaine kisses. And then she goes in and kisses Jerry. And he says, actually, she does this thing with spiraling her tongue. Like this. And then another kiss. Jerry says, yeah, I think you got it. The actress who plays TV Elaine is Elena Wall. And I think she's really good. I, I really enjoy her. When they, when they end up watching the pilot, I do like how she plays Elaine. I think she's really fun. And then um, just real quick, I think I don't like Jerry's dialogue in this scene. I, I don't know why. It's just super annoying when he's like not giving actual answers. But I suppose they had to make this funny. But <laughs> I feel like they could have given more of the funny to this actress because I think Elena Wool could have definitely handled it. She's a funny actress. But instead, they just went with all this, these dumb answers Jerry gives, and it's really annoying. I think there was more to mine from the fact that she's this method actress and call me Elaine. Like, she's she's really funny. So uh, we could have had Jerry be the straight man in this scene and Elena be the really funny one. But missed opportunity, I suppose. Next, we're at Monk's. Kramer is meeting with TV Kramer. And sort of mirroring the uh, previous scene, he's explaining all the stuff he likes, the way he eats pasta, how he likes to have sex, which is apparently, <laughs> I prefer the bottom. Let them do all the work. <laughs> Jeez, Kramer. Um, and TV Kramer <laughs> is annoyed. This doesn't matter to me. He's going to play Kramer the way he plays Kramer, not like him. And Kramer is so offended. You know, you got to play him like me. I'm Kramer. Then we see Elaine enter. She approaches the manager to apply for the waitress job. He looks her up and down and asks, well, does she have any experience? And she says, yes, I've waitressed for 10 years and uh, hands him all these references. Obviously, Elaine has prepared to be a very qualified waitress. He surveys her again and says, no, I don't think so. And then she gets in his face and says, you're in big trouble, mister. And that's trouble with a capital T. What did I do? I love this moment. I, I love Elaine getting in his face because that's the Elaine we love. But I'm not a fan of the line, the whole trouble with the capital T. It's a good delivery, but come on, could have been a better line than that. All right, next we are at the Equal Employment Opportunity Office. Elaine is talking to an agent in his office and telling him about the big boobied waitresses. She makes reference to Russ Meyer films, which the guy doesn't really understand. Oh, he made these terrible movies in the 70s with women who looked like that. He's obsessed. He's obsessed with breasts. Huh, that's hard to say. And then Elaine tells the story while well, he rejected me, he looked me up and down and said no. The man calls in another guy and says, this woman's in here telling me about a restaurant on the west side that's only hiring large-breasted women. And the guy says, really? Uh, my take real quick. I love that Elaine's ending up giving these guys just a just a great recommendation for, uh, you know, some eye candy, some uh, buxom waitresses for them to look at. The obsessed with breasts line is eh, the only comedy for JLD in this scene, and it's not great. Not enough, in my opinion. Just feels like there could have been more, but it's clear they wanted this scene to be pretty transactional just to move the story forward. Um, but I do love the way Fred, the guy sitting at the desk, says, <laughs> large breasted women. <laughs> it's just so like, it's just so professionally said. It's really funny. 
Okay, so this is what I'm going to deem the end of part one of this episode. So I am going to go ahead and take a break and I will see you on the other side. Russell Dalrymple had it all. A high-powered career, a beautiful daughter, a cool apartment with a sunken living room. But after meeting a mysterious woman at his favorite lunch spot, his life would take a tragic turn. Coming this August, a documentary about the fall of NBC President Russell Dalrymple in Cleavage of Catastrophe, The Russell Dalrymple Story. Tune in to see exclusive interviews from Russell's closest friends and colleagues. Oh, Russell was tough, but he was an exceptional leader. I had the utmost respect for him. He was more than my boss, honestly. He was, he was like a father to me. Until he fired me for dating a writer of one of the shows we were making. Oh, he was my idol. Russell, he knew what he was doing, you know? He was just so confident. Well, until, uh... Until he met her. A chance meeting with publishing associate Elaine Bennis was the beginning of the end for Russell. We talked to the former head chef from Pfeiffer's, the restaurant where it all began. Yeah, I knew her. Complete a psycho, by the way. She came to the restaurant and verbally assaulted me because I complimented her shoes. Oh, I'm such a monster. Yeah, no, she was totally insane. Poor Russell. I wish I could have warned him, you know? This four-part docu-series will take you into the mind of this complicated man. A man who was tough in the boardroom, but soft in matters of love. His daughter Molly reveals details of those dark days where he was constantly obsessing over Elaine Bennis. It got really weird. Like, he'd tell me the story of when he met her over and over and over again. How her cleavage just, like, drew him in. And I was like, yuck. And in a last-minute twist, after months of no response, our producers hear from the one person who has never broken her silence. Miss Bennis, please have a seat. Don't miss Cleavage of Catastrophe, the Russell Dalrymple story, streaming this August on a streaming service you probably don't have yet. Cleavage of Catastrophe. The Russell Dalrymple story. Low cut, but high risk. And we're back. I'll go over the extras for part one of this episode. Um, There were some notes about nothing. I thought this was interesting. This episode aired before the series finale of Cheers, which gave Seinfeld record ratings because it was the lead in to one of the most anticipated series finales of all time, Cheers. I remember being excited for it. We taped it. It was a big deal. So this episode, the pilot, was the lead up to that. And also it aired as a full hour long episode, but in syndication, it was divided up into a two-parter. There was a cut from the script. Now, this goes back to what my wish was for uh, George and Elaine to sort of butt heads on this whole big boobied waitresses. And, you know, I think George would have something to say about that. So apparently there was something in the script that ended up being cut. And so this is what that was. George asks Elaine what the goal of her filing this report is. And he says, quote, you think your little raid is going to stop us? You can't stop us. Wherever they are, we'll find them. On the streets, in movies, office buildings, magazines. We know they're out there, and we'll be watching. Elaine's response was to say, So, George, tell me about that Chinese man on the bus, because, you know, I spoke to Dana, and I'm a little fuzzy on a couple of details. And then George immediately shuts up, not wanting to get into his private therapy sessions with Elaine. Um, (laughs) now this was... I just, first of all, great that they cut this because that just makes Dana Foley a really shitty therapist because aren't you not supposed to discuss private sessions? (laughs) So um, if anything, that just makes Dana Foley look bad. But also, um, yeah, I just don't think that would have been the approach I would have wanted from George. I think he would be more uh, prone to 
point out the hypocrisy. Um, Elaine would love it if there were hot waiters at a place, you know, that kind of stuff. But anyway, that I just wanted to mention that apparently that was a thought by Larry David to include George and Elaine butting heads about this. But uh, yeah, that little part that was written but cut, great decision for it to be cut. But um, <laughs> yeah, just not feeling uh, feeling the whole sort of Dana Foley's a really shitty therapist angle of that. All right, I'm going to save Contributor Corner for next week's episode. As you can guess, our trusty contributor Greg did send in some thoughts, but his thoughts cover the whole episode. So I figure it's best to save his wonderful thoughts for when we've gone over the entire episode. My favorite Elaine moment for part one, it's definitely that whole scene with Russell. I love I love the line in particular when she says, you're part of the problem. The way JLD plays it, we sort of, we feel what Elaine's discomfort is, but yet she's very strong and very direct. So I love that choice. That's how she's playing it going like, listen, you know, I mean, there's really no sympathy at all, which there shouldn't be. I mean, this guy is obsessing over her. And as she says, that was two months ago, their date. So it's just absolutely ridiculous that Russell has these feelings and that they're that strong. And this is where I'm going to end part one of this episode. Next week, of course, I will cover the second half of the episode. So thank you so much for listening to this first part, and I will see you next time. 